Hey, it is good to be together wherever we're gathered. Lone Tree, Port Lavaca, Cuero, Parkway, Victoria. Everybody worshiping at Parkway Online. It is good to be together because we all need a church family. We need a church family to do life with, to serve with, to worship with, to make a difference with. And I'm so glad that you're a part of the Parkway family today. Today we're kicking off a series where for the next four weeks, we're going to look at how you and I as believers in Jesus can rightly engage in the political world around us. And as we engage in the politics of the day, I'm going to encourage you to live differently than the watching world. I'm going to encourage you to know your convictions and to live your convictions, to vote your convictions. I'm going to encourage you to see how you can be a difference maker in how you live and how you think and how you participate in this election cycle and many more to come throughout our life. See, this is something that I believe in 2024 the church must be speaking to because we must set our priorities in the right place. We must, as believers in Jesus, know our role and responsibility in the world around us and so that's what we're going to be talking about for the next few weeks. When I was celebrating my birthday last month, the girls and Christy and I went to see a movie in Dallas. And I was like, dude, you are a crazy, like, dude, you drive to Dallas to go see a movie. Yeah, that's about how crazy my birthday celebrations are these days. And we went and they said, dad, you get to pick the movie. And so I looked at the phone and said, I, I want to go see the Reagan movie. Reagan was president whenever I was a preteen and stepping into understanding what was happening in the world. So hearing the story again and being retold the story through this movie, it was a good movie. I think real life was better than the movie, but it was a good movie. And as we were leaving, I said to Leah, I said, you know what? I said, our country could use a Reagan today. Inflation is through the roof, just like it was in the late 70s, stepping into the 80s. There's trouble on the international front, just like there was late 70s, stepping into the 80s. There's a division in our country. We need another Reagan. And as we kept walking, it hit me. Pastor, you've got that wrong. We don't need another Reagan. We don't need to put our hopes and dreams in the future of our country on the shoulders of another man or another woman. In fact, we don't need another Reagan. Instead, we need, we the people of God, to live as the people of God in the world around us. To see that politics is a place that you and I must live our faith. That you and I must engage properly. And I believe we've got work to do in this area. In fact, through this series, I'm going to make some comments on culture, and I'm going to do a lot of correcting of the church. Because I believe that we, the people of God, have a role to play, and we play that role in godly ways, because if we are doing things to honor him and please him and to share him with others, then it must be consistent with who he is and how he's called us to live. And so today, I want to talk to you about how you and I can be engaged, and how you and I can be informed as believers in Jesus as we step into the political environment of our day. And my core passage is from Philippians chapter 3. In Philippians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul is talking to the church and instructing, instructing them not to put their hope and confidence in the flesh, not to put their hope and confidence in their religious actions, but instead to set a singular goal for their life, to forget what's in the past and to press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of them. Paul says the most important thing in your life is you running your race to love and please and honor the Lord. And as we look at how we live our lives today, engaged and informed, there is nothing more important for your life and my life then we live a life that's pleasing to the Lord. Considering everything else like trash, the Apostle Paul said, but striving to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of us. And so with that thought in mind, we pick up today in Philippians chapter 3, 
verses 15 through 16. The Bible says, All of us then who are mature take such a view of things. And if at some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. I love this because Paul says, hey, I'm going to challenge you to live with a mature view on things. And can you imagine the difference the church could make if we all decided I'm going to take a mature view on things according to Scripture and how we live and engage in our world? Can you imagine how we can make a difference if instead of going progressive, we found our truth from Scripture? Can you imagine the difference we could make if we stopped name-calling and we started loving people with the love of Christ? Could you imagine the difference? If the church decided, I don't simply want to seem right, I want to be mature. I don't simply want to vote right, I want to be mature in how I love God and how I love people. Could you imagine the difference we make if you and I would simply say, the church of Christ, that's us. Our highest goal is to please the Lord and to take hold of that for which he took hold of us, to have a mature view on things. And what I love about Paul in Philippians chapter 3, I love it about the church as well, is Paul says, if you disagree on things that I say are the mature view, I pray that the Lord will make your conviction clear too. See, the great thing about the church, even as Paul was dealing with the church at Philippi, we don't have to agree with everything all the time to be the family of God together. But I hope and pray, even as I say some things you might not agree with, that the Lord would crystallize your convictions. And that the Lord would make his truth known to you as we study his word together. But can you imagine the difference we would make if you and I would say, I want to take a mature view on this world I live in and how I can be informed and engage in the political world. How do you do that? Well, Paul says, check who you're following. Philippians 3, 17 through 18. He says, join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Paul says, I want us all to have a mature view on things. And then he does a reality check. But not everybody has a mature view on things. In fact, some people have such an immature view of things, they live as an enemy of the cross. And Paul is challenging us here to have a mature view on things so that we live as friends of Christ, not enemies of the cross. That we live as friends of Christ by treating people as God loves them and as God respects and honors and is pleased with them, created in his image, that we treat people as though they matter. And we hold the truth that's not swayed by culture, but is instead is defined by scripture. Friends, too many Christians live as enemies of the cross when it comes to the political world. There are some things that we do to separate our faith from our belief, and that from our faith and our belief from our politics. And that is how, one way we live as an enemy of the cross. We're going to talk more about that in a moment. Some people mistreat others because they disagree with them politically. Friends, that is living as an enemy of the cross. Because the cross is Jesus' ultimate expression of love and sacrifice for all. And life offered to all. And I have to tell you, it breaks my heart, just like Paul says here, with tears. It breaks my heart when I see the people of God live as enemies of the cross. It breaks my heart. Because can you imagine the difference Jesus could make in the world through us if we would take a mature view on things and live as his friend in this world? Could you imagine if we decided we want everything to add to our testimony and nothing to subtract from our testimony? Can you imagine if we considered our witness before we considered our witty post 
on social? Could you imagine if we tested every thought for its truth before we held on to it with our life? Could you imagine the difference we could make in the world if we lived as a friend of Jesus? But not everybody does this. And the Bible here says, Philippians 3.19, their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. Now in Philippians chapter 3, Paul was speaking about a group of people that were coming in and requiring religious actions for people to be Christian. Jewish actions for people to be Christians. And Paul says, as they are laying that legalism on the people, they have disconnected from Christ as the head of their life. And now they're focused on earthly things. And what happens when you get your eyes off Jesus and you wrongly focus on the world? You drift. What happens when you drift? That disconnect turns to bad decisions. That disconnect turns to loss every time. And friends, I have seen people who have made politics their idol, have made politics their God, and they have disconnected themselves from the head that is Christ, and it's not good or healthy for them. Friends, as we look at rightly engaging and being informed in the world, we know it starts with King Jesus as the leader and the Lord of our life, and no one else and nothing else. And so as we study his word today, one simple question. What does it mean for believers today to be engaged and informed? What does it mean? Because we look at the world around us and we're tempted in one of three directions. We're tempted to put our head in the sand and pretend that things will get better. It won't. We're tempted to throw our arms up in the air and say, well, it, it's getting worse by the day. I just give up. Or we're tempted to be radicalized in our beliefs and stop loving people like God loves them. But what does it mean? It means that you and I must learn the practice of discernment. Proverbs 18 verse 15 says, The heart of the discerning acquires knowledge, for the ears of the wise seek it out. Friends, as we look at our world, you and I must practice discernment as we engage in the political world, knowing that there is no perfect candidate, knowing that there is no perfect party platform, knowing that we choose in this great democratic republic, we must practice discernment. And I have to tell you, perhaps you've been where I've been in this. There have been times when I've shown up to the ballot box and I knew one person or one issue that I was passionate about that I was going to be voting for. But I'm clicking through those other screens. I don't really know who the railroad commissioner is for the great state of Texas, but I'm going to vote. I don't know who this judge is, but I'm going to vote. And in that moment, you know what? I wasn't voting on my information or my engagement. You know what I was voting for? I was voting for the letter that came behind their name. I was voting for their party and not for that person. And friends, in today's world, we must test every person and we must test every party to see, are they honoring the Lord? Will they lead our people in this great nation in a way that's pleasing and honoring to him? What's it mean to be engaged and informed? We're going to talk about this throughout the series. First, it means we pray for our leaders. It means that we pray for those that God has placed in authority over us. We believe that God shapes the hearts of leaders in his hand. And so we, the church, must be praying for our leaders. What does it mean to be engaged and informed? It means that we know and vote our values and convictions. And studies are showing that in this election cycle, there are up to 100 million self-identified Christians that have chosen not to vote because their convictions don't line up with a candidate. 
because their values aren't seen on the trail. Friends, I encourage you to practice discernment and to engage wisely and to be a good steward of this great nation. And a part of the way we do that is to vote our convictions and to vote our values. What does it mean to be engaged and informed? It means that we advocate for righteous policies in righteous ways. If you believe the most loving thing for our city, for our county, for our state and country is a policy that protects people, is a policy that guides our future, then you must be a proponent of that policy in a way that is righteous. Because if you are chasing something that is right but doing it in unrighteous ways, you're not living as a friend of the cross, my friend. And then the fourth way that we engage. We see men and women called by God, Bible-believing, people-serving, spirit-submitting. Men and women serve in our local and county and state governments and even in our federal governments. We see God place godly people in positions of leadership. And God doesn't call all of us, but if God calls you, say yes to his call, friends. We pray, we vote, we advocate righteous policies in right, right ways. We look and we say, God, if you place me, I will say yes for such a time as this. Because if Christians don't engage, think about this, church. If Christians don't engage, what or who will fill the void? And when Christians rightly engage in the political world, it's an expression of our love for God and our love for our neighbors. Friends, as we talk about this today, I want to challenge you with something. Because the greatest issue of today's election the number one issue the church should be concerned about is citizenship. See, the politicians have made it about immigration. And that's not what I'm talking about. The greatest issue that you and I should be concerned about in our lives, with our vote, and our values, and our communities, is citizenship. And it's simply this. Are you living as a citizen of heaven, as a friend of the cross? Because you and I, if we don't see ourselves as salt and light, we'll put our head in the sand, throw up our hands. If we don't see ourselves as called by God and placed by God and used by God where we are, we give up. Or if we see that our primary citizenship is in the great state of Texas or the greatest nation on this planet, then we get our priorities jacked and out of whack. The greatest issue is citizenship. And Paul writes it here. Philippians 3, verse 20 through 21. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that we will be like his glorious body. Friends, you and I have civil responsibilities. We have civic responsibilities here and now. But know this, your greatest responsibility isn't to your city, county, state, or federal. Your greatest responsibility is to your living Lord Jesus because our citizenship is in heaven. And I've heard it described that as we believe in Jesus and we live our life here on earth, it's like a camping trip. It's uncomfortable. It can be dirty at times. And it's nothing compared to going home. And with a biblical worldview, can I remind you that even though our life is great on many days here and now, it's nothing compared to the kingdom that's coming with Christ. May I remind you that we know our values and vote our values, but there's only one person that will ever establish the kingdom of God here on earth, and his name is Jesus. There is a, you can give me some of that, I'll take it. 
there is a minority of Christians that are teaching something called Christian nationalism. And the idea is simple, that if we could get a godly leader in place who would put God-honoring laws in place, and then we could have a Christian nation, and we could take dominion over everything around us. But here's the challenge with that, and I push you biblically on this. Because there is no political party and no political leader that could supplant the place and person of Jesus in our world. The kingdom of God is not established by anyone but the Son of God. And so watch your theology as you engage in politics. And I see why some might engage in that, because it sounds nice to have a country where the laws make sense and where people are kind. It makes sense to have accountability. It makes sense to be well protected by our government. But know this, friends. Government is not the solution for the soul of our country. Jesus is. And that's why we put our hope not in a political party or a political person, but in the Son of God alone. I love how John Adams, our second president, put it. He said, we recognize no sovereign but God and no king but Jesus. And here's the challenge we face, because some of you are like, Mike, this Christian nationalism thing, I've heard the media toss that around. I've heard the media label Christians as Christian nationalists. And friends, as we look at things, I want you to know that you're not a Christian nationalist. If you believe that God is sovereign, he's in control, he's in charge. You're not a Christian nationalist if you believe God places men and women in positions of leadership to accomplish his purposes. You're not. You're not a Christian nationalist if you are convinced that you must vote your political values and your spiritual values that you cannot separate those things. You're not a Christian nationalist. David French says this, it's no more illegitimate or dangerous for a believer to bring his or her worldview into the political debate than it is for a secular person to bring his own secular moral reasoning into politics. So in 2024, we must have a high view of God and his sovereignty. And we must have a high commitment of Christians to live and bring their biblical values to the public square. And some of you have been taught all of your life Faith and politics don't mix. You want to kill a good dinner party? Talk about religion or talk about politics. You want to get in a fight over Thanksgiving with your uncle? Talk about politics. You've been told that faith and politics don't mix, but here's the problem with that sentiment. Your faith impacts every area of your life. As believers in Jesus Christ, we compartmentalize nothing and we trust him with everything. If our faith and our politics are separate, we have a small faith and we have lousy politics. That's why what we do instead is allow our faith to inform our politics. We allow our faith to inform our convictions, to define our values. We allow our faith to determine how we vote, who we vote for. We allow our faith to inform our politics. And just to be crystal clear, that is a one-way arrow because our politics should never, ever inform our faith. When you start allowing Fox News to supplant the voice of Jesus Christ, you have allowed your politics to inform your faith. When you allow CNN to define what your truth is, you have allowed your politics to inform your faith, and it never works that way. Instead, what do we do? We know and vote our convictions. The yellow and blue of our faith and politics becomes green when we vote those convictions. So I would encourage you, friends, to know and to vote your convictions. And as we look at it, let me describe to you what I believe the issue of our day is when it comes to convictions. And it's an issue of our day that's been brewing for about 50 years. And the issue of our day is the issue of objective truth. For the last 50 years, 
objective truth, the idea that there is one truth that's true for all people. It's not a relativistic truth where you got my truth and your truth. No, it's the truth. For the last 50 years, there's been a battle for objective truth. In the 60s, when the hippies were happy, what were they doing? They were undoing the moral standard of the day and asking, did God really say this is right or wrong in our sexual ethic? In the 70s and 80s, the objective truth that when a baby becomes a baby was challenged. Is that a baby or is that a fetus? Is that a life or is that a choice? The question began to be asked, in the 90s, the undoing of objective truth was found in what constitutes a marriage. Don't ask, don't tell. In the 90s, the question was, what's a marriage? And then in the 2000s and today, we see the fastest cultural change ever. And it's all based on the undoing of objective truth and the issue of gender fluidity and our identity. Friends, all of this is rooted in the undoing of the objective truth of God's word and the acceptance of our society to totally unhitch itself from any objective truth. It's crazy, friends. This gender fluidity, not only is it now a question of what is my gender based on my identified choice, but now there's even people coming and saying, I'm a different species than human. Friends, there's a problem when even science is undone by the insanity of a lack of objective truth. And so let's make this clear. God has had the first say on all of these seemingly new issues. And God's word will also have the last say on all of these seemingly new issues. No matter how far our culture goes, and here's the problem with where our culture is and where it will be going. What is tolerated in one generation will be celebrated in the next generation, and what is celebrated in that generation will be mandated in the next. Friends, that's the undoing of objective truth and you see it with your very eyes. So I would encourage you that as you and I engage and are rightly informed, that we never forget that morals are established not based on my feelings, wants, needs, or desires. Morals are determined by the very word, the truth of God that is objective. It has no expiration date. It's objective. It applies to every nation, every tribe, every tongue equally. It's objective. It speaks to every generation. It applies to the issues we're facing today, the objective truth of God. We build a biblical worldview because that worldview holds our truth. You know, the culture around us does not agree with that. And that's a dangerous way to live. And it's a dangerous current to get swept up in. Because the Bible says in Proverbs 14, verse 12, there's a way that appears to be right, but in the end it leads to death. And so I encourage you to not get swept up in the cultural change of the day that unhitches our lives from the unconditional truth of God's word. And even as I say that, and I talk through some of the issues where God has spoken and culture's adding a question mark, where God has an exclamation point and culture's asking a question, did he really say that? Is that really true? Does it even matter to me? Anytime you're trying to find a moral standard, in today's day and age, someone will say, who do you think you are to tell me what's right? Well, friends, as believers in Jesus, that's why we must know the word of God. Because we are not speaking with our opinion alone. We are speaking with an informed conviction and values from the word of God. We can't settle for opinions. We can't settle for platforms. We need convictions and believers living those 
convictions. Convictions where God is given an exclamation point and culture asks the question, such as the issue of life. Never a hotter issue than that today. As we see Roe v. Wade being undone on the national level and each state determining their own convictions. A biblical worldview reminds us that we are shaped and formed in our mother's womb. A biblical worldview reminds us that God has a purpose and a calling on every life. A biblical worldview reminds us that in Proverbs 6, there are six things that God hates. And one of those is hands that shed innocent blood. Friends, as you look at a biblical worldview and you discern and you pray and you look at truth and you look at candidates and you look at parties and you look at platforms, on the issue of life, I've heard it said that there is no pro-life candidate in this campaign. Even the most conservative candidate holds to a 15-week abortion ban. And CDC stats show that 95% of abortions happen in the first 15 weeks of pregnancy. So even the most conservative candidate isn't saying, I want to stand for all life. He's saying, I just want to kill a few less than them. Pastor Gary Hambrick said that the Republican Party is today where the Democrats were 30 years ago when Bill Clinton said abortion should be safe legal and rare. Friends, we are building not a political worldview, but a biblical worldview. We look at marriage, and some would say, Jesus never said what a marriage is. Jesus never defined what a marriage is. Well, a biblical worldview says different, Matthew 19, 5 and 6. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they're no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. And here, both the church and culture have work to do. Because the culture has opened the door to all types of marriages. And this is a problem that is undoing our families at the very core. You want to know why I care? I care because of the impact on families and kids in our communities. But you know what, church? We've got work to do here, too. Because the church, while it holds a conservative political view and says marriage should be between a man and a woman, the church is living together in unprecedented rates. Deciding to play house before becoming husband and wife in unprecedented rates while judging the sins of others. Undoing the family themselves. And so I would encourage you, church, remember, we're not just voting for the letter behind the candidate's name. We are building a biblical worldview, challenging ourselves to be conformed to the image of Christ. Speaking of image, on the issue of gender and our identity, this one's answered too. Genesis 127. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Friends, we must remind every man, every woman, their value before God. And that they were created in his image in need of a relationship with him that only his son can provide. We must remind them that their greatest identity that they carry is son or daughter of God. And so if you're here today and you've never put your faith in Jesus, I want you to know that your greatest identity isn't Republican or Democrat. Your greatest identity isn't based in your gender. Your greatest identity is son or daughter, and you can only become a son or a daughter of God by putting your faith in Jesus. So I would encourage you to consider that. And as you look at the issues of morals in our day, remember, God has had the first word on these issues and will have the last word on these issues. And he wants us to have a mature view on things and to know and to vote our convictions. One last thought, and I'll wrap it up. And in all of these things, whether it be life or morals or marriage or gender, in all of these things, remember the words of Booker T. Washington. 
A lie doesn't become a truth, a wrong doesn't become right, an evil doesn't become good just because it's accepted by a majority. Friends, in the early 80s, there was a group of people called the moral majority that were trying to shape our country in healthy ways. While I didn't agree with them in all things and all ways in those days, I'm more concerned about the immoral majority that's leading our country today. We must check our own commitment to biblical values. We must know our own convictions. And then we must vote them. So you see, Mike, you've said a lot today. In fact, Mike, you've said so much today that I need help to know in everything you said. Remember, your citizenship is in heaven. Our home isn't here, but we're responsible for what we do here. And so we live and vote our convictions. Our convictions aren't defined by the culture of our day, but by the teaching of the apostles and the prophets and the very word of God that we hold in our hand and we open on our phone. In all of these things, Jesus is our only hope and the cornerstone of our life. We put our hope in him. So friends, we don't need another politician that can give you a wry smile and, well... We don't need another politician that will speak truth to power. We don't need another politician to put our hopes and dreams in for a change in our country. Instead, we, the people of God, must be the people of God in the world around us. That's our hope as we live for Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the chance to open your word and to learn and grow together. God, I pray that you help us to live what we're learning, to hear the comment on culture and to accept the correction of the church. God, I pray that we would live what we're learning and find our own convictions and find our own values from Scripture. And God, I pray where we're immature, whether it's because we've disconnected our politics from our faith, that you would call us to a mature view of things. We cannot separate those two or we're immature in the way we treat people. We want what's right in our eyes, but we treat people wrongly in yours. Help us to mature, Lord. And as we get through these last weeks, help us to be salt and light as we trust you. As the church prays, if you've gathered with us online or on campus and you've never put your faith in Jesus, I wanna encourage you to believe in the one who died for you and was raised again to believe in the one who's coming again and will establish his kingdom, to believe in the one that is your savior. And if today's your day, you can mark it with a prayer. You can pray, Jesus, I believe. I believe that I'm a sinner who needs a savior and that you are the savior of the world. Thank you for coming for me, for dying in my place and being raised again from the dead. Today, I believe. Thank you for giving me life. Father, as we continue to pray, I pray that you would continue to move and work in our church family. God, I pray you would use these coming weeks to shape us and mold us and to conform us into the image of Christ, that we would be like your son, Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen.